We will now get a situation report from Kira Ganti and Paki from Switzerland about these uh, from the Swiss net politics scene, and they more or less deal with the same issues that we've had in German net politics as well, and that we keep having to deal with in, a, in an infinite loop. And we will now hear from these three about the our neighboring country uh, and what the newest insights are. Please welcome them with me. And welcome to our translation of this talk on Swiss net politics. You're going to listen to Sebelis, Desco and YT, hashtag C3T, Twitter account C3Lingo. Now, we're very happy to be back for the 36th sixth Chaos Communication Congress and take you on a journey on Swiss net politics from Lake Constance to the Matterhorn. And our travel guide in the next hour will be a travel guide will Paki Steli, Ganti and uh, Kire, and we're from Digitale Gesellschaft, Digital Society. We are a non-profit organization in Switzerland, and we deal with the issues that come from digitalization and networking in society. And we do that from a civil society perspective. And we are mostly a an alliance of various organizations in Switzerland that deal with net politic issues, net politics issues. So let's dive right in on our journey and I'm now going to hand over to Paki. Yes, thanks a lot. And we'll begin our journey all the way through Switzerland from Lake Constance to Matterhorn in the eighth largest city, not of our country, but of Canada, the largest city. Uh, and that's Vancouver. Uh, the issue is e-voting, um, or some call it cyber voting. And we had to report last year, unfortunately, that one of two accepted uh, permitted systems for e-voting would not be continued. Uh, for cost reasons, it seemed, who would have thought that? Um, but there are new requirements, such as the uh, digital capabilities for e-voting systems of the next generation and one of these systems called Skipple that was a Spanish uh, software company and the Switzerland is operating the system from from Skittle. Uh, they do everything that a hacker would like from e-voting um, research of Republic, a Swiss newspaper uh, uncovered that um, the some of these urns are somewhere in the jungle they are paperweights more or less which had to be counted in Spain which in, and this take took place in Ecuador and they kept a few managers of Skittle in Ecuador as tourists of course now the pressure was high on Skittle that it should work in Switzerland uh, and they said we will try to prove that our systems are safe that was the idea and we we'll, and we thought that we would run a public intrusion test the source code had to be disclosed that is actually legislated and as little as 150,000 Swiss francs were invested a very small amount I assume that the overall system would be would cost uh, hundreds uh, hundreds of times of that so uh, the source code was disclosed in form of a dump really no commits and there was an NDA that had to be signed and that said vulnerab vulnerabilities cannot be published of course that is responsible disclosure uh, so if the post office would uh, sign in every 45 days, then these vulnerabilities would not be discovered. There is no security institute, no reputable researcher f would uh, get themselves involved for such a small amount. And information, of course, has a tendency to want to break free. And so, so what happens? Um, there were leaks. Um, 
And of course, the post office reads Twitter too, and they responded that information is already public, cannot be leaked, which was clear at the time the leak, uh, that this reply was written, but it had been leaked but beforehand. The only way to reach that code had was via the NDA, the non-disclosure non -disclosure agreement, and and then, then they pointed to the copyright issue, and uh, the result was that the cloned, rep cloned repositories had to be taken down, but it wasn't quick enough. Because through the leak, that was the only way possible that reputable researchers could actually look at the issue, such as the Open Privacy Research Society. Uh, they are from Vancouver, and representing them is Jamie Lewis, the, the editor there, the, the, oh, the director. Edit. And there's a <coughs> and the result was that every single zero knowledge proof implementation had security issues, uh, critical issues. So the backbone of the whole solution was broken because zero knowledge proofs are about ensuring that so only uh, every person can only vote once and that their vote is being counted and that the votes are tallied up correctly. So the result in the end was, well, burn it with fire. My impression when I looked at the system as a cryptographic layperson, I don't know much about cryptography, but I understand that when you load cryptographic keys and then cannot load them and res resort to some kind of fallback and, and write something that, uh, that's not quite the way a system like that can work. And I thought, when I read that tweet, I was thinking of this image. That was what, how Sarah must have felt. And well, the post really, the post office really do read Twitter because a few days later, they, it turns out well, it wasn't that bad. All the errors are corrected. Let's cover it all up. And the problem, of course, and I know that as a software developer, I write a line of code to fix something. Then I have two new bugs. At least that's how I experienced it. Well, and the core problem was that the, this whole system would have gone live if we hadn't exerted massive pressure on the post office, Skittle, and, and the electoral office, the parliamentarians that we were in weekly contact with. The system would have gone live in this way without any of these vulnerabilities having become known. Or maybe people would have known about them but used them for their own purposes. So I went back thinking about this image when the smaller chamber in our parliament, the National Council, uh, sorry, that is a larger chamber. When they resolved that the e-voting should be abandoned, well, that is no reason for rejoicing because the other chamber, the smaller chamber, will surely reject this motion and therefore it's extremely important that you sign the initiative for a moratorium on e-voting which calls for e-voting to be suspended for the next few years and the state of art should be looked at to find whether a secure e-voting is possible so that it should be evaluated so, evaluated. so support these initiatives. We'll continue with Simon on our journey to the seat of government in Bern. I'll take you to Bern. We'll shortly talk about the EID and as a location in Bern, we have this door. Politically active people will know this door. It is part of the parliamentary building. This is the place where if you hand in an initiative or a referendum, of which there are quite a lot in Switzerland, we hand them in. Now, regarding the EID, that was quite a struggle. It still is. The problem is in in the fact that the government would like to offer an EID, but it is disputed how this EID should be shaped and which functionality it should have. Regarding the government, uh, the idea is that uh, a login should be required, uh, which you could use for e-commerce. There is one application that they have in mind. Uh, of course, the EID is not about that. It's not a login. It's about 
conducting certain kinds of business where an ID is required, such as legal contracts. Uh, when signatures are collected, you could do that in the digital arena as well. You would save a lot of paper that way and save a lot of trees. Our position is that the EID should be used for political participation and not as a login for certain commercial products. The history, uh, the story of the EID is a few years old now. The government worked out various concepts, studies were conducted. Two keywords in that keep coming up in these documents an electronic identity has to be secure and trustable, trustworthy. One concept that was looked at, similar to Germany with their new ID card, but that was rejected in Switzerland, uh, and the conclusion was that the best solution for an electronic identity would be to hand this over to private providers, such as identity, uh, they are called identity providers. The government a few years ago had uh, an event, a project called the Swiss ID, not written in the way it is here, but Swiss in the French way, spelled in the French way. This failed. The new edition of that uh, is carried by a consortium, the Swiss Sign Group, which includes the post office, the, the railway, um, banks, insurances, and others. And these uh, are to take over that governmental task of letting us identify ourselves in the digital sphere. While the process in Parliament has uh, finished, or was running, Digitale Gesellschaft and Public Beta and uh, We Collect and others ran a representative survey with the question, well, who should offer such a kind of electronic identity? And as you can see, this blue area is quite large. And if we then resolve this, 87% of those ask want an EID that is provided by the state, and 2% want it to be provided by private companies. Although another question in this survey was, is the EID a requirement, is a need? And 43% said, yes, we would like to have an electronic ID in the next three years. And this survey, although we had commissioned it, is quite interesting because we were talking about security and trustworthiness earlier, and the verdict of the people is clear. The trust in electronic voting is placed at the state and not at private corporations. And whenever there's an emergency, then we try to take to take an influence, and when there's a particular emergency, then a nerd will then <laughs> borrow a suit, because they don't own one, and we then went to the commission that was debating this ahead of the vote in Parliament and tried to make our voice heard. As a short insert, a commission in Switzerland is a parliamentary committee in Germany. So. Issues are first debated in a s smaller group, and then the plenary will receive uh, suggestions. So the equivalent in Germany would be the parliamentary committee in Germany or in other countries. And we had a few supporters. These are parliamentarians who uh, took up our issue uh, that we wanted a state and non-private ID, but the support wasn't. It was very short term. And Parliament said, we don't care, we want a privately run a private relationship with the Swiss consortium, and that's how it came, and that, so it came, you got to where you had to get to. If you don't like a certain issue, you go to a referendum, and that's what we did. One of other of you will know the WeCollect platform that collects votes or voices electronically. You can have the signature form uh, in a printable way there, and uh, that will be generated with the right address in it. 
We had a start boost through this, a lot of mobilization, and an information campaign uh, really was effective. We had a lot of signatures initially, but then, as always, we had to go the conventional way and went out onto the streets in snow and rain. And we talked to individual citizens and asked them to support our cause. And with referendums, what you have to do is within 100 days, within 100 days, you have to collect 50,000 signatures. That's tough work. And at this point, thanks a lot to everyone that contributed by signing, or that uh, handed out, handed around the the signature form in in their social circles. And when these forms come back, they have to be sorted. They are sent to the individual municipalities, and uh, they would then have to certify that this person is residing in that municipality. Then they are sent back and counted. There's a lot of administrative work involved. A state EID would surely be a practical solution here, but unfortunately we haven't gone, come that far yet. I can report good results here. The, the referendum deadline is the 16th of January and the fairy dust has started. We won't have just 50,000, but actually around 70,000 signatures. We had one or uh, two referendums that we took part in, the surveillance laws were involved, this was fundamental issues. We knew from the start that it would be hard to win uh, when we came to the country, but here we quite clearly saw that the population wants a state-run EID and we're quite confident that we will win the campaign and therefore compel Parliament to reissue this law with the respective changes. Everyone that wants to come, 16th of January, third, quarter to two in Bern, in the square in front of the parliamentary building, there will be a ceremony and the signatures will be handed over. And uh, probably in May or September, the Swiss population will be able to vote on the issue. So now Paki is going to take you to a very special place. We are now in somewhere in cyberspace in the Schweiz. It's going about a network blockage. There was this uh, law regarding uh, regarding uh, her, um, money. Uh, each and every year we have a special picture to illustrate uh, the problem. These blockings are uh, going to be implemented in July. This is a specification. There was a couple of problems. And if you have a closer look, uh, you know it had to come at some time. There's a nice website uh, where you can go and uh, see this stop sign and you're blocked from as accessing the the money. Geldspiele. The gambling. This list of uh, forbidden sites, there are two. The, the one is uh, from the gambling uh, companies themselves. You see in the left part uh, the domain names and uh, when uh, the ban has been issued, there was a legal uh, of publication uh, and there's a deadline for 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 uh, publishing. You can see these are sorted by date and not by uh, by name and not by date. This is the other one. Uh, you see the newer updates appearing. I've had a look at these sites. 
uh, as uh, when they were published a couple of days later. I've clicked through all these uh, lists um, are containing 39 posts, uh, 32 different companies. Some uh, companies have uh, several websites uh, with d uh, URL 1 to 17, and they're twice in this in this list. The list uh, from Comwall was more uh, complete with. At the time when I tested these, two, two of these were blocked. As a Swiss uh, citizen, when I wanted to go there, that means I either got a stop page uh, that I couldn't use this, or I, or I could not uh, choose uh, to Swiss as a, a country of origin. And now you can see this stop page, and uh, the alternative uh, page telling this is not available. So I couldn't use these offerings. And in the in the law, the law says you can't uh, be uh, prohibited from accessing. But it, it comes even worse. This sp specialist of uh, sanitational things. That might be, uh, that is probably a, uh, a prob uh, error, but if you come from Switzerland and view this site, you you can see this the blocking is not accurate and there's blo they're actually blocking too much. If you uh, go to a, a search engine and. Uh, type in this, uh, you can see the list, uh, how we, how you can access uh, either w otherwise blocked sites. We also publish a transparency um, report, and now we take the S-Bahn, so the train to Glarus. The next topic is net neutrality. This means that all data packages should be have the same um, transmission rights. This is one of the essential um, aspects of the Internet where I should not be in the position to ask anyone for approval to offer a service on the Internet. This is a, an example from Portugal, where with the so-called zero rating, um, certain um, services are included, but others have to be paid additionally. We do not want that this is possible also in Switzerland. We do not want that not included services in such packages have uh, worse um, quality and transmission. So over several years, this discussion is already ongoing. It started in 2013 where we were invited in a discussion group how to to discuss how to regulate net neutrality in Switzerland a lot of meetings over an entire year with uh, heavy and difficult discussions a lot where we were the ones in, in the lead of setting the topics. The result was very disappointing. It was a um, rather weak report um, reporting on the different arguments of the, of the members of this discussion group. And in 2016, subsequently, a law, um, 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 a draft law was published. And in this draft, 
it was only talked about transparency, but not net neutrality as such. So it would have been a way back, a turn back from um, the uh, quality principle and we would have had a much worse situation than now without this draft law about naturality. In November 2017, so a year later, we were invited to describe our position in the parliamentary group and we used this opportunity to propose our own draft law, how net neutrality should be best put into law. And then some movement ensued actually and the commission answered on our uh, proposal and changed their draft law, which has been approved by the large parliamentary um, group. And then it moved over to the small parliament chamber, where the so-called special services were introduced. This is a similar discussion that also happened in so the the purpose of the law would have been actually changed by introducing these special services and and this has been this this information was submitted to Parliament and and the example uh, there is a certain perseverance. Uh, we, we we know that with certain per perseverance, uh, things can be achieved, and uh, um, we have these. We had call from from a representative of one of the cantons, and uh, the law was then enacted or resolved, it is part of the telecommunications law, the tele regulation on net neutrality is included there. There are exceptions for special services, but these are now put in a way that they can only refer to a provider's own services, such as TV or internet telephony. The law overall is a big success for the net politics community in Switzerland and uh, quite surely it will be enacted in this uh, come into force in the second half of next year now to the next station on our journey we go to Zurich Switzerland's largest city and uh, we will look at copyright the copyright law in Switzerland in Switzerland a revision project was started this year and uh, before we get into the technical details and a pre-remark if a law is before a law enters parliament you can give your own opinions as a member of the population certain institutions are being written to and asked for the, their opinion but citizens can hand their opinions in as well and 1200 uh, res replies were received at the respective department so that is almost a distributed denial of service attack on them and uh, one of the key issues in the planned new copyright law was the ancillary copyright uh, which the uh, Swiss media companies uh, pushed through into the project and this is an obligation to uh, pay for uh, links to journalist content which you could call it a link tax so if you link to a page with journalist content you are supposed to pay a fee uh, as you know it from using audio recordings for example now the fact that that is not a good idea can be quite is quite visible in the European space some examples here is France 
This is a French example where an ancillary copyright law was introduced and Google says, well, we're not going to pay. We'll just exclude that content from our Google News search results. And the second example in Germany, where an, an ancillary, ancillary copyright law was introduced as well. And when this was introduced, the first action was to say, well, Google will gain an exception. We've just enacted a law and at immediately we will just take the bite of the law. In Spain, there was an ancillary, ancillary copyright law without an exception. And as a result, the traffic on news sites went down by 10 to 15 percent. In Switzerland, when the new copyright law uh, process was started, an alliance was formed for a fair copyright law, an alliance for a fair copyright law, and you might know one or other of these logos. And um, we are now in late March last year, and something else happened all over Europe at the time. You may remember the debate on Article 13, the upload filter debate in in the EU. These are not really related, but in a short amount of time, about 5 million signatures against the upload filters were collected. Now, in Switzerland, we have to fight with copyright law, but also at, in, on the European level, there was some movement here, and this movement uh, uh, was manifested itself in a European strike day and we used this opportunity and had a demonstration against our new planned copyright law and that's why we have come to Zurich now because more than a thousand people took part in that demonstration to protest against the new copyright law a few days after that, we were invited into the responsible commission in the smaller chamber and we asked to have the answer copyright law be taken out, have it taken out. And I'm now going to show you a video from the, the session in the small chamber. This is the president of the responsible commission and he is now going to explain to the plenary that the ancillary copyright law should be deleted. The ancillary copyright law, we had we run a, a consultation process and journalists on the one side and the representatives of the digital societies and Google on the other side. And of course, you can always be of a divided opinion whether a single company should be invited to a consultation or not. But because the ancillary copyright law, firstly, uh, would affect Google, would be a Lex Google, we explicitly said to involve them in the consultation. I can report to you that the setting of the hearing, the introduction of the reports from the administration, the two experts with their knowledge and the debate with the representatives of both sides was again gleaned many insights and I would like to say very clearly that the uh, that the application to reject this really improved the quality of the law and it's not easy to say this as a president of the commission, dear colleagues. <laughs> well, the new copyright law was then passed in Parliament, the ancillary copyright was taken out and there would have been some other items that we didn't like in the new law, but at least we were able to take a small part out. So a partial success, very nice in Borat style. Oh, sorry, we are now moving on into depths of the canton of Argo. We are going to Oberville Lier now. That's a that's a place you can f uh, drive around like this. It's going to be a data protection law. The now current uh, law has been passed 1990 through. It's quite old now. There has been a couple of years debating the law. 
the law is for the time being being totally writ written. The two chambers of parliament are passing it back and forth. The new uh, law is going to uh, be uh, uh, compliant with the European law. So, so uh, we also in the future can be regarded as being part of the Europe, uh, Europe and data can be passed th over the border with no uh, problems. Uh, compared to today, uh, it is uh, in danger of being less protective than it is today. The uh, target is to, to modernize this. The parliamentarian from this place to this man, it, uh, the law is a molo, a, a huge collection of uh, nonsense and uh, superfluous uh, laws. Uh, SP, Green Party and uh, Liberal Party uh, are not considering this law to be uh, going far enough and the, the argument is that uh, there has to be taken some consideration that uh, the uh, A current discussion point is uh, tracking and profiling. This is one of the big debates that is currently taking place in the parliamentary rates. When uh, personal data is automatically uh, processed to uh, depict um, behaviors, Currently, with the current data protection law, it is required to give consent for such a profiling based on a proper um, information, because only like this is can be assured that such a consent can be properly given without being hidden within the terms and conditions at the large. This is a this is an example with such a profiling Cambridge Analytica where psychological profiles of millions of people f has, have been created by a Facebook app which have then been used in the US um, voting campaign for micro-targeting. But also in Switzerland, more and more activities have been launched to um, create tracking on a Swiss paper internet sites the goal is personalization um, advertisement, but also personalized content. And this is what it is the current debate is on. So personalized profiling. The goal is to agree on a risk-based approach which means that there will be a profiling with high risk or low or middle risk to be differentiated to then um, decide whether an explicit consent is required or not. For this, as, a, as an input criteria, it is to be decided or to be differentiated based on the source of the data, which is a bad decision because one, if you look at the Cambridge Analytica case, one source can have very high risk information already. 
So if you then combine sources of different areas of life, the risk would even increase. But here it is currently unclear what really is meant with this risk-based approach. And it is unclear whether the parliamentary chambers will agree on this. What it also means that a, an opt-out would be missing, actually, in this case. So what we are requiring, what we are requesting is that there should be a simple and easy opt-out approach or possibility for all, for everyone. So that everyone can actually use a service, but can um, say that they don't want to be profiled. So such, such an opt-out approach would also be good for this website. So now we continue our uh, travel. No, Lucerne. Data richness. You can make a lot of data, uh, man money with the data. The so-called data rechtum. There's this uh, this man has sent 22 unsolicited emails and has not uh, answered to request for for uh, and now there's this uh, bill for for uh, unsolicited mail he's got a, a fine on 220 uh, frank uh, but uh, curiously a couple of days after this event at Info Brock Brother Award, Big Brother Award, is, uh, comes has uh, received spam mails again. And some data you haven't access to uh, can be leaked as well, as uh, Swisscom experienced. They uh, product MyCloud, this is a drop, drop box kind of thing with, with precision and uh, has been uh, deleted by an accident and 2% uh, where the who didn't lose all their data uh, did lose 2% of the data and then they got a, a voucher for uh, buying something more at this same uh, company. Uh, in the next case, where they uh, where three and a half thousand CS people have uh, gotten uh, data from their colleagues, and uh, this considers uh, uh, metadata about connections. CS is Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse. So. Thank you. Uh, it uh, reminds me of Coopbank that uh, there was 10,000 of uh, receipts that was leaked. And uh, if you live in a small community, it could buy, be quite interesting. There was this with the USB pen stick. Uh, uh, a woman who was working as USB was moving to Germany and uh, on her USB stick, I didn't get that, there was, well, the data was then obtained by tax authorities who handed it on to France and uh, that's how uh, it worked, that the bank secrecy was actually violated and uh, this came to court. Um, we don't quite know why the court case was rejected, but this 
person had to pay extra tax costs and, and legal costs as well. The next case is a curious one. Um, if you move in the net, you need Tor. What you should not do is go to the Apple Store and log in there or use the Wi-Fi because there is video surveillance there and the police then obtained the IP address and took some screenshots from the video camera and printed them out and included them in the file as you do with modern police work and the problem was that the images were kind of poor and uh, the police in the canton of Zurich uh, has 3D measuring technology for photographs. They have laser scanners they, to, to make uh, sketches, produce sketches. And with these, the accused was then measured. They attached points to their joints and uh, biometrically measured those. And in the end, the result was for the investigating authorities that they had ensured the identity of the accused. Now, if you do nonsense somewhere, don't do it at the Apple Store. And now to the last part of the journey, and again we're coming back to Zurich. For, uh, to, to, to conclude, I would like to point to some events and meetings we have this February, we had a Winter Congress in February 2019, which will also take place in 2020 in February. We will then go to the Rote Fabrik, the Red Factory, with the new edition, the third one of the Winter Congress, and that will take place on Saturday, the 27th, 22nd of February 2020. There will be 28 talks and workshops and that the Winter Congress will also mainly be for exchange and the detailed program and tickets are available from now on. And uh, in April we will have a data travel office in Zurich, we will open that in April we will move together with other NGOs into a shared hacker NGO flat. We will have various institutions coming together here in this space near the Hartbrücke in Zurich. And then in 2020 we will have various meetups in particular, in particular, I would like to point to the Net Politics Meetup on the 9th of May in Bremgarten. That is our semi-annual meetup where the more active members and organizations uh, within Digitale Gesellschaft will spend a few days talking about the issues that they will consider re relevant in the in the remainder of the year. And also at Congress here, we will continue next to this talk, which is so at half past three, we will meet in the lecture room M2, where we will talk about the issues coming up next year and we'll seek an exchange. The lecture room M2 is reachable by going through the glass hall, going to the adder hall and turning right before you enter the other hall really and we would love to have as many people as possible from from you and meet you over there but we will be present f uh, around uh, over the four days of the congress and our location is just below this this hall e here uh, this is i think it's the about freedom cluster that the translator adds so we have a few minutes for questions and we are available for those okay thanks 
to the three of you for this information and the talk. And you know how it works. If you want to ask questions, there are microphones in the room and there's already someone at microphone one. Hi all. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding EID. And this is how are you planning to win this? The lobby of industry is quite uh, important and are quite important in refer referendums as well. Uh, and they got a very strong argument regarding the Commission the president. The parliamentarian who was uh, convinced by Google. And, uh, and uh, putting forward the argument that uh, these uh, uh, people are in fact working in favor of Google and uh, the main argument is that uh, the, the one who's really got uh, hurt is uh, Facebook and Google and the second argument is then they will say that the state is having a big uh, role in this not uh, in uh, not in running the system but in verifying the actual identity how are your stra strategy for convincing the public I'm afraid that the problem is that the 87 percent who want the state to run this uh, uh, might have this opinion but they're not active and I'm afraid that uh, the people who don't care uh, will make up a big problem yeah, well, the question of the EID, this is the main issue is, in my opinion, is what it's going to be used for. And from our point of view, it's quite clear that it is about the transition of the conventional ID documents into the digital world. And we see the need for an electronic identification an electronic ID everywhere where you have to identify yourself, which means that whenever I have a mobile phone subscription, want to open a, a bank account, or want to conduct e-government processes, it's not about having a general overall login and least of all a central login with an EID. And that is a different objective to that that Swiss Sign wants to pursue or Google. We do not want to enter into competition with a Google login or a Facebook login with the EID. And we cannot do that anyway with a Swiss law. That is the wrong approach. Maybe through international standards we could do this, but not through a legislation in Switzerland companies outside of Switzerland would not follow a Swiss law. They would not uh, accept a Swiss EID for logging into f uh, foreign services. So it, it's about the services that really require a Swiss ID. Question to the signal angels. Do we have questions from the internet? No question from the internet. There had at least been one listening from Switzerland. How nice. <laughs> I wonder if any non German speaking Swiss people were listening to the translation. Thank you very much. I've got one question for the AID. This uh, public vote has been described as this we're going to win this one. I'm a teacher 
uh, and uh, if I look at the people uh, supporting this, and there's a couple of names who are, uh, who are quite interesting, and these uh, all kind of uh, pensioners. Uh, how can we engage young people? Well, probably there are two or three groups that uh, have a critical view of the idea in the way it has been passed so far, and these are one those that are in favor of an, an EID but think that the current profile of it is wrong, the way it's shaped. And then there are others, many others, which I would probably assume the pensioner associations to be who regard the whole project critically and therefore have a more rejecting position on it. Second question, microphone one. The concept of decentralized IDs is uh, proposed to be con uh, integrated in IID. The state will act as a provider for, for the actual identity. Well, decentralized, that is something we would like to see, but our approach would rather be one similar to that taken in Germany, where you have verified identities that will be stored in the ID documents, for example, on a small uh, on a smart card, and the issuing of such an EID would then come together with the issuing of the conventional document. You wouldn't need to set up a separate infrastructure or a central database that is currently envisaged. So, in places where identity cards are produced, the conventional ones, the smart card with the extra identification properties could be produced and, and the uh, necessary information for the electronic signature could be added there as well. In the currently passed law, this option has been taken out and uh, oh, is not included. And these infrastructures for by the, by the identity providers would then not be needed with such an approach. And we would like to have that neither by the state or private uh, providers. So it would no more be like in the Israel ID. Israel or Iceland, what was mentioned? Uh, I see no further questions, so I'm now going to close. And thank you to all speakers. Kere. Okay.